Hi guys, welcome to Psychic Babes. I'm your host, Kirsten Sandifer, and today I'm super excited to have these two guests on. Um, if you listen to my podcast, you will remember my lovely mentor, Eve, um, who's joining us today. And hello, Eve. Hey, Queen. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Danny Goler is our next guest, which I'm so, so excited to have him on. He's a fellow DMT explorer. And um, there's something amazing that if you haven't already heard that he's discovered um, that we're going to get into. So um, let's talk about what you discovered and kind of how that came about. Uh, thank you, Kristen. First of all, I'm honored to be on. Mm -hmm. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you, Eve, for your many incredible, uh, insightful gifts. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this, the story of what is discovered and how I came upon it is is a lengthy one. Uh, but the more I talk about it, I kind of find the, the key points that I think are maybe the the most necessary to understand. Uh, so what I will do is I will give people a very brief background and then I will give you kind of like the punchline and we can pedal back and you can ask me questions according to what you feel is Absolutely. important to outline. So the, the general gist of it is that just like many other people, after doing DMT quite a few times, uh, being flabbergasted from the fact that it's even possible to have that kind of an experience, you then slowly move into a more stable region of that space as you explore it. Uh, I guess according to what uh, Dr. Uh, Andrew Gallimore is talking about in his latest book, uh, Reality Switch Technologies, uh, that the brain essentially acclimates and starts creating a certain elements or structures of that space and that becomes a little bit easier to discern what in fact is going on because anybody who tried DMT knows that it's just, it's, mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's not an exaggeration to say that it's beyond anything you could have possibly even imagined that was possible. Um, uh, not just in content, and this is I think a key point both to the discovery and also to understanding that space in general, but also in the how realistic the space appears. So one of the biggest components of DMT to anybody who never tried it is that many people say it feels more real than real. And if you've never experienced mm -hmm. it, the first thing that comes to mind is like, oh, come on, what do you mean by that? It's, uh, I always equate it to the same experience people have when they wake up from a dream and then they, you know, they're in reality. There's certain parameters we use even without thinking about it to determine that now this is the real world. And we never think about it because it's just kind of like, okay, now I'm in reality, right? But there are things like edge detection. There's many others that the brain uses to establish, okay, now this is real, right? So imagine mm -hmm. that one level up. That's what DMT feels like when you smoke it, that basically this was the dream and now we wake up to some kind of a larger space. Uh, so I've had this experience like, like basically anybody who smoked DMT. But after years of, of experience with it, uh, I started having sets of experiences that are if it's even possible to uh, imagine, even more real than that. It felt all of a sudden that this was like a new level and had a tactile feeling. It was basically integrated into my regular life. I would stand <laughs> in my room and this content would be downloaded into my room. It was just like happening around me. And at that point, I just said, okay, wait a second. This is not, th this cannot be what we call brain, mind made. This cannot be my imagination. It's completely orthogonal to anything I've ever conjured in my own thoughts. It's not something I've ever, like even that style of, of the way it appears, it never came to me. It never appeared to me uh, even close to that. But also it was extremely continuous over time and coherent. Like, it was almost like a phone call, like the content of where we ended would pick up in the next session. And that made me really ask myself, okay, what can we ask? They can potentially bring us to a deeper, uh, uh, to closer to answering the question whether this is in fact a real space. Because many people toy with this idea. You hear this uh, both in spiritual uh, traditions and, and you know in the new awakening realm with like the you know the more modern version of awakening. But you also hear it in psychedelic spaces, and but people kind of say that as if it's a given. And they, they leave it at that. They say, yeah, there's, you know, there's something beyond, there's, there's a space beyond. And I ask myself, okay, but if that space is real, 
we must be able to say something about it. We must be able to ask some kind of a question that will tell us this is why mm -hmm. we can say that this is more real. And I started playing with that idea. And after many years of contemplation, trying to figure it out, reading uh, science papers, uh, talking to people, uh, I landed on this idea, and this is the punchline, I guess, that if you project a 615 nanometer refracted laser, diffracted laser, which in simple terms just means a red laser with a little diffractive pattern that basically creates kind of like, you know, you scan in the supermarket, like this X that you scan mm -hmm. for, you know, mm -hmm. construction. Um, if you do that and you smoke DMT, you originally, when I discovered it, I, I didn't know what it was supposed to be doing, but I knew that something that was supposed to be happening there. And, uh, and I tried it and it worked. And to my surprise, and this is where it gets novel, uh, you see code <laughs> running in surfaces. Now, mm -hmm. let me just close the window. This is uh, slightly inconvenient because when people hear about this now, the first reaction, which I probably would have the same reaction, is like, well, I mean, everybody's, everybody saw the Matrix. So mm -hmm. this is in the cultural, you know, zeitgeist. This is in the ether mm -hmm. of our awareness. So, of course, you're going to see some kind of a, if you already assume that we live in a simulation or something like that, then that's how it's going to appear to you. You took this very powerful psychedelic, and now it, it, manifests itself in the way that you would expect because you saw this movie just like everybody else. And I completely understand that pushback, but that pushback completely falls apart when somebody actually experiences it for themselves. <laughs> the first thing I would say is that I did have people that never seen the movie see it and they, oh, this is an important point. Sorry for being a little all, all over the place. Everybody sees the same thing. So everybody sees the code. I now have 173 verifications all the people that look at it this way see the exact same content. We can talk about the content. We can agree about the content. We can agree about the parameters of the content. We can point to things in real time, say this is this, this is that. Um, and that's the thing that really separates this from any other thing in that space. Because right now there are uh, people and uh, even uh, uh, the Imperial College in London famously they now have the extended state uh, research uh led by dr uh chris timmerman and they are focused on exactly that trying to map the space and answer the question that i asked myself leading into this but they're approaching it from comparing notes like comparing people's encounters with entities and things like that yeah. which is a great start but it's very it's still very subjective like uh, many people can mm -hmm. see different things the code allows us to talk about something that is always what it is and it's stable. Thanks. So, yes. yeah, I think that's important to also talk about what is in the code. So it looks like, and I'm emphasizing looks like, because it's not exactly that. It looks like digits yeah. from zero to five and Japanese katakana characters. Once again, the thing that actually makes it very inconvenient to some degree, uh, but it's not exactly that. I had somebody who speaks Japanese who saw it and he said, yeah, it looks very much like that, but it's not exactly that. Uh, but it's very clearly some kind of a code, some kind of a language. Uh, it's very discernible. Mm -hmm. That would be the word I would use. Um, what do you think about a drink, a dinker codes and it being sort of the error correcting codes that um, have been around for? So just, so just to maybe give a thirty second outline of what it is to the audience who doesn't know what it is, a dinker codes are essentially mm -hmm. visual representations of. Uh, complex mathematical uh, structures that, that basically they don't resemble. They are exactly what error corrective correcting codes that we use in computers today, discovered by uh, Dr. Sylvester, actually spacing on his last name, but he, uh, you know, he essentially discovered that if you go into string theory and you go to the core of what the equations tell you, you discover not like, but error correcting codes that we have devised ourselves to help us uh, manage communication through browsers and through messaging. And uh, it's important to know that Dr. Again, I'm spacing on his last name, but Dr. Sylvester uh, is personally engaged for the last maybe 12 years in really trying to 
reframe this and tell people, I don't think that this means we live in a simulation. So it's important to note that. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, it doesn't resemble the adinkras themselves, which are basically the visual constructs. It literally looks like language. It doesn't even look like the closest that I see also certain structures there that resemble another visual representation that a famous, uh, somewhat famous person produced, which is the Alison Gray characters. And I'm sure a lot of viewers mm -hmm. probably know what it is. Mm -hmm. So some of the structures do seem that way, but when you look closer, they are not that. The language I'm talking about is actually much smaller. It makes up the rest of that. So it, 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 there's no closer representation than to say that it looks like Japanese katakana characters. And when you're peering into it, because it feels like there's so many different layers within reading um, the, and I don't think I've gotten down to seeing this best, the, the small code that you're talking about, but I'm going to be purchasing the laser and doing this experiment for myself. So I'm super excited to do that. But I have seen on the human body, there's these same kind of codes um, and structure making up the human body when I look in the mirror. Yes, so once again, great distinction. Uh, this is a, a comment I'm getting a lot now, both online and people email me about it, that uh, they claim, a lot of people claim to see codes, both when they wake up, like in the state between dreams and uh, regular waking life, and also some mm -hmm. people are more sensitive. So they say that sometimes just haphazardly they would see codes running in surfaces or even in, on other psychedelics. Uh, many times people would say they see it on MDMA, uh, but in other substances. Uh, it's important, mm -hmm. the, the important difference between the, I know exactly what they're talking about, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. It's more like the codes are subsumed within surfaces. It's almost like they're, uh, it's like they're on the surface, but not on the surface. It's hard to describe, but- Overlaid kind Overlaid, of? but also subsumed within, mm -hmm. like it's, it's the, at the same okay. time. It's almost like it has a double representation. But the main component I noticed that is different about these codes is that they can be manipulated with, with your attention. So if you pay close attention to these codes, mm -hmm. if you do something with your attention, you can view them as either numbers or letters. Like for example, I can switch them between the Japanese looking things to regular numbers to then look like Hebrew letters. And I don't know if it's because I, I happen to also speak Hebrew. Uh, for example, I also speak Russian and I couldn't translate it to Russian. So there's certain things that you can do with them and certain things yeah. can't. But the one distinction I want to give is that what you see in the laser, you can't change. Or at least so far with everything I tried, you can't do anything to it. It's almost like that layer is objective. You can't, no matter what you try, it doesn't mean that we not necessarily, you know, might discover that it can be changed. It's just in a different way. Mm -hmm. My best hypothesis about that is that there's the layers of these codes and, uh, mm -hmm. and some of them are closer to our human dimensional experience. And those can be probably the ones that I see that you can manipulate with your attention because they're the ones that corresponding closer to who you are because they kind of code for your mm -hmm. reality, so to speak, or maybe yeah. maybe explicitly. Uh, but the ones that with the, we see with the lasers seem to be, the resolution is much, much higher. It looks like a very clear digital clock uh, and they cannot be changed with your attention, which leads me to believe that they might be coding for a much more objective portion of reality like the laws of physics or things. so the hard coded yeah. those are kind of the hard coded yeah. things okay um eve i would love to hear your thoughts on this um well the thing is it's it, not that it's difficult but i'm hesitant to speak on it because i haven't yet done the experiment Right. So because I don't have uh, an understanding of what's going on, I'm not sure that I'm quite equipped to comment on what actually is being viewed. I am excited to do it. I guess I'm a bit I'm laser lazy. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good I'm going to steal that. I'm going to use that. Laser lazy is good. Well, anybody who's laser lazy, we can build you one. <laughs> it's yours. So I really do the laser and then once i have the laser i'll go you know deep in the realm and i'll absolutely come back with an opinion on what i've wet witnessed and perceived um but until then i keep going yeah. all That's right true. yeah uh, danny what is this because this begs a larger question if this code is being projected from somewhere it's obviously being projected at us by someone or something can you yeah so Right. So yeah, so there's actually two different questions folded into what you just asked. One, mm -hmm. the first one is, what do you, what do I think are the, the 
the, the actual mechanics of how we see this. The other one is who made this? Like, what is what does that mm -hmm. mean about the larger portion of reality? Um, the first question I would say that I think what's going on is that it's not projected. Um, it's that what we're looking at, what I think, is we're actually looking at space time from another mm -hmm. layer of experiential level that we didn't have access to so far. So uh, it's, you know, the big contention in science is how do you inject the observer into a regular scientific framework? Because so far, all we know how to do is to handle things that we can measure, count, things that we can put into math equations, which, of course, is very understandable because that's the only way we've found so far to make progress. That's how we build our modern world. That's how we're having this conversation right now. Uh, it, 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 needless to say, I, I don't understand the people who bash science. This is very confusing to me. Um, but... Um, I think that there's now a possibility to utilize this discovery to finally inject the experiencer in a more, more objective manner. It's just that we have to tweak some of our assumptions about how in fact reality comes, comes to us as this experiential tapestry. So, because I think that what in fact is going on is that space time, like in many, many spiritual traditions, people believe, you know, you, you create your own reality. But mm -hmm. now we have a p potential to actually probe that and, and conclusively or semi-conclusively answer that question. For example, right now I'm engaged in trying to uh, play with the, what we see in physical terms. So I'm creating different uh, experiments with uh, project projecting it through different materials, playing with uh, magnetic, rotating magnetic fields around it. And I have a lot of other, you know, things in the pipeline of how we're going to go about it. But the general attempt is to see if we can tweak anything about what appears to us on that code while smoking DMT. If we do these particular things from the outside, we put a magnetic rotating magnetic field. Did anything change? We played the sound. Mm -hmm. Did anything change? We projected through this material. Did anything change? And if we find that there's any of those components I just mentioned that is introduced into the experiment, and then all of a sudden something changes for everybody, here you have an objective way of saying, hold on, what does that mean about the relationship mm -hmm. between experience and what we see right now happening in front of us? It's almost like that is the screen. You get a, an actual screen into an interface, into what reality is doing from a deeper level, and then you get mm -hmm. to probe into it, and it, don't, it introduces a possibility for a whole new kind of science in which people are, you know, yep. they go into a state and then they run experiments only where in the state and now you discover whole new things. Uh, and as to the other question, which is like, who is, who is actually, uh, you know, doing all of this from the outside? Um, <laughs> this is where it gets uh, a little more difficult to talk. Because... Get, get weird with us. Okay, it's totally okay. fine. All right. <laughs> My audience okay, loves that. Cool. So. <laughs> So uh, it's actually, yes, yeah, so it's like, so <laughs> I think that you nailed it on the head. It's really difficult when you don't know exactly who you're talking to. Um, because whenever I say they, with everything I'm saying, people kind of like nod their heads mm -hmm. and they're on board to some degree. And when I s use the word they, they stop me and they say, wait a second, who is they? That's the first <laughs> time that it kind of jars them. So, uh, <laughs> so what I see, and I don't want to, you know, uh, again, uh, trigger anybody, but to the extent that I trust my experience and to the extent that the same, whatever you want to call them, communicated to me how to arrive at the laser idea and everything else that I'm doing, to the extent that I trust that what they're telling me is correct, mm -hmm. what in fact is going on is that the world is not what we think it is. So the world is what we call computation but computation is a much larger thing that we don't quite fully understand. Uh, mm -hmm. To people who doesn't, don't know, computation is, we take it for granted, but uh, Alan Turing discovered something called the, universal, the principle of universality in computation, which essentially means that there are things that you can define very clearly what they are. They're called uh, Turing machines. And they are basically, uh, to, to keep it very simple, they are... 
I actually don't know if in the technical terms they're, they're software or they're hardware. I think they're hardware, but it doesn't really matter. Computer scientists will correct me on this. But either way, they're, think of them like as computers that can basically simulate anything in existence. They are univer they're, there's something called Turing complete, which means that if a computer is Turing complete, that means it can actually render anything that is possible, given enough time and computational power. That's what when yeah. you people say Turing complete means. Mm -hmm. The brain, as far as we know, is Turing complete which means that it can technically code for anything. Uh, and the reason that this matters is because what we thought about before, which is the laws of physics, is essentially merely one layer of how you can code for it. But the larger structure is computational. So in other words, think of it like this. We didn't invent computation. We discovered it. It's almost like it's mm -hmm. another law of mm -hmm. physics, or like a larger yeah. law of physics. And in that sense, a simulation would mean a layer of reality. So if a civilization would discover this, it doesn't even, this is an important, crucial point. It doesn't necessarily mean that a civilization just takes a computer and then runs our civilization on it, like a, like a, like a proper mm -hmm. simulation, like in a matrix. It might be that the civilization, would, the civilization will discover what I just said and then learn how to manipulate this fabric in order to create new layers of reality that then you can call simulations because they're, they're, they are building those components from this larger space, but they're the ones that actually creating the frame for our layer. Mm -hmm. So for all intents and purposes, with our dumbed down version, what we call computation and simulation, this is a rendered layer, but mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that they are fully the masters of reality they yeah. just mastered this particular thing about reality that allows them to do that. And as far as like who they are, uh, it's probably the Japanese. They beat us to all of it. That's why it's Japanese characters. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> somebody sent this to me. Somebody sent this to me and it was really funny. It's like, can you imagine if actually the Japanese figured it all out and they're just running the entire world. They're just simulating all of it. <laughs> this is why it's like that. Um, but I, I don't know who they are. I do know that it's somebody. And I do know that they're interested in something. Uh, mm -hmm. And it kind of goes a little bit against what you would imagine, what we would imagine an enlightened being of doing. Um, because not in an evil sense, just in the sense of not being able to let go of the ultimate question. It's almost like they're interested in answering the question. Um, and that's why a lot of those computational layers running because so they can try and learn from different beings as experience and see if they can come up with some kind of a frame that matches in all of them, no matter how different the environment mm -hmm. is. Um, and I don't really know, I want to be very candid about this. I don't really know how this connects to what I'm hearing a lot of spiritual people, especially modernly spiritual people telling me about unity and the source and all of that stuff. Uh, it appears to me that there's there's definitely a possibility that that is also running at the same time. But I think that it's w very early to say, at least for me, it feels very early to say, mm -hmm. what is, are they the same thing? Are they competing companies who do things differently? Are they, you know, who? what is the source? Like, I, I don't know any of that. This is not clear to me at all. Uh, but uh, but I know that the ones that are communicating to me, the ones that kind of like talk about the layers and all that stuff, they're very real beings, and we're now approaching a level where we start comprehending what is going on, and maybe I will tie this point for another 30 seconds and you can continue. Um, people talk about the secrecy of the thing. Uh, you know, people sometimes email me and tell me, I hope you have protection. They send me this video about that lady <laughs> with the simulation, then she disappeared. I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, I, I am that, I, get the same I am that lady, everybody, just so you know, I'm, I'm actually, yeah. Um, so, Any. um, but, uh, but the thing is, is that, uh, it's, it was never a secret. That's what I see. It's just that mm -hmm. we didn't have the cognitive tools to understand what's on the table. So now that we're reaching a point where we understand computation, we have certain, you know, uh, spiritual awakening, we understand the deeper essence of what, you know, the present moment is, things like that. 
Uh, I always give the example of, you know, if you have a computer with a bunch of like code running on like a regular computer with a code running on it, mm -hmm. and you have a software engineer sitting in front of it, the software engineer will understand everything that's happening and what can be done and all the possibilities. A regular person mm -hmm. that doesn't know, uh, you know, coding or anything like that, they will still recognize that there's code there, but they won't know what to do. They don't understand the rules by which this is happening. Mm -hmm. But if you put a chimp in front of the laptop, the chimp wouldn't even know that th there's anything happening on the screen worth noting. And w for all intents and purposes, we were the chimps until now. And only now we're becoming the regular person who knows a little bit of code or about code. So we start recognizing these things. And because we're entering, it's part of our natural evolution. It's not something that anybody can you know, accelerate or, or dumb down. This is for mm -hmm. us to decide how fast we go here. Because we're entering a stage in which we start to understand these things, it's inevitable that very soon we will start understanding more. And because we're going to start playing with their space as well, they're kind of cushioning the process from the other side so we don't get scared or, you know, they're kind of like they're, they're helping us understand. That's the... Just so... I just, I just want to... Sorry, go ahead, Eve. Would it be fair to say that maybe this experiment is working in, in a way kind of like a microscope, right? Because we're ready to bring conscious awareness to another realm. Like we, without microscopes, we would have no idea how many cells and bacteria and all of that that's going on and how much intelligence is working on the smaller realm because we're not, our consciousness isn't expanded to focus on it. We're more like ego, egocentric. So is this could you say maybe that it's starting to behave like a technology? So, hey, this is another thread of the fabric of reality that we're experiencing, maybe? Yeah, I yeah, the, the details of how things work. So you nailed it with okay. the microscope, yeah. So, um, the, so it's fair to say that there is an intelligence on the other side, and I, I can validate this. I have experienced the exact same thing um, in many different ways. and. It feels like they want us to find these things. They want us to come to these conclusions and uh, they assist with a lot of things, at least in my case with healing stuff. I mean, there's many things that I've been taught that I did not know previously. Is that the case with you as well, Danny? Yeah, uh, I'm actually, I'll, I'll be very honest. I'm, I'm, I'm a big student when it comes to this stuff. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I guess it was never my focus, uh, the healing stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm meeting more and more people like you that are in the space of helping other people to heal and understand and wake up. Uh, so I'm becoming more sensitive and more aware to the importance of these things. It's not that I was never understood the importance of these things. It's just that I, I personally didn't know what to do with these things because I was, and still probably is to a large degree, so cerebral. And for me, the, the whole, you know, uh, feeling world and uh, even though, you know, I meditate on a regular basis, I did retreats, I understand the... I, I understand the spiritual pursuit, but I don't, I guess I'm, I'm, my makeup is such that I'm not, I don't see myself so much as a healer or, or somebody who's, you know, helping others to, to heal, but I'm helping others to understand. And because of, I'm mm -hmm. saying this to the effect that you asked me if I learned something from the space, uh, I, the messages I'm receiving, the more around, like, how do we build a technology from it? How do we understand the larger reality from it? Mm -hmm. And maybe that's my role. Maybe, you know, and other people's receive the information of how to heal. I'm, I know a lot of wonderful people in that space and I'm doing everything I can to promote them and support them because I think that entering, fully entering the space at the end cannot be done with certain impurities for lack of a better term. And in that sense, mm -hmm. the healing, I think it's not a coincidence that there's such a ramp up in this, you know, this whole world of enlightenment because it's so crucial for all of us to be able to enter through that gate. Like we have to have a certain level of like, no, no well, I think it's vibration. So, sorry. Right? So the things in my time with DMT is, uh, it's eventually brought me to the state of efficiency over empathy. And if I sit in an emotional state that 
really like trauma, for example, there's a level of density to uh, what you're creating and what you're experiencing through that word. So I think part of the healing process actually is allowing ourselves to ultimately come to this objective state where if this is my creation and how I choose to perceive the experiences that I've had and I'm having is what affects the level of the video game in which I'm playing. So if I would like to experience a technology in a state of possibility, it's important that I vibrate at this frequency and part of that, I think, is deconstructing the the role of the other. And I and they, I get it. They are incredibly convinced. My in my perception of reality and my experience with this molecule, it consistently and constantly reminds me there's no such thing as they. So that being said, although I like to draw the circle around the circle, they are the dogs sitting on the bed next to me and they're very convincing. They is the conversation I'm having with two very convincing separate entities that you guys go and experience yourselves and I experience as you as somebody else. But at the end of the day, in my perception, we're all the same thing experiencing ourselves as each other. So I think that they is a higher dimension of us experiencing ourselves on a grander scale. Like it's almost like the little fingers separated that are actually a part of the hand that are actually a part of the arm that are actually part of this cosmic body of intelligence, which also technology allows us to continue to zoom out and realize that we are simply a cell in a very in an ever expanding galaxy that's expanding into itself. You isn't know, that, like isn't, it's, isn't that a Monty Python song? <laughs> what? Isn't that a Monty Python song? <laughs> it's, it's, oh, I gotta say, <laughs> cool. <laughs> But it's and something that I do say is because especially in the healing community, it's a medicine, it's a medicine, it's a medicine. I get that. And it's a medicine until it's a technology. And so I think mm -hmm. because you're more objective and science minded and when we heal ourselves, then we're ready for possibility. And I absolutely 1000 percent believe that DMT is and these psychedelics do get to behave as a technology because they're so advanced in what they allow us to experience. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that's part. And Danny, you and I have talked about that before. I believe that that's part of the character that you're playing and bring this in, bringing this in objectively with and making it tangible and workable. And I'm really very excited. I believe in what you're doing a thousand percent. That's why I'm on this call. So I'm it's very it's very fun to see where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I also wanted to talk about Danny. Have you noticed that there also seems to be a correlation with technology and the entities or they um, or us, whatever <laughs> we would like to call it? Um, have you noticed the correlation? with a uh, technology like for instance i've seen certain words come out of the screen that completely separate from any thought that i'm having yeah have you have you noticed oh, that yeah, correlation yeah. so there's a lot to be said about the objectivity of some of those phenomena uh mm -hmm. um let's see which thread we pull here because this, this space is infinite mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. i would i would start by saying that there's a new research that came out literally i want to say maybe a week or two ago by mm -hmm. another absolutely brilliant researcher uh, by the name of uh, Andres Gomez. Uh, he's the guy that uh, most people know from, he had, he had this famous uh, talk in Harvard where he broke down the DMT space to different layers according to um, geometry. I don't know if you ever saw this. So The hyperbolic uh, geometry. Exactly. So that's Andres. Yeah. So I've been in contact mm -hmm. with him since I pretty much discovered this. And, you know, originally, because he was steel manning the other side he was very interested in steel manning the argument that this is mind made and he was explaining mm -hmm. how he thinks it's mind made uh and I, I i i must say also from my personal interaction with him he's by far one of the smartest people i've ever met he's absolutely brilliant uh and i and i emailed him to tell him why he's wrong so that's that's, that's, that's something about my, my psychology but but uh but we, we, you know, we, we have a really good like personal interaction as well. And one of the, the one of the recent things that he discovered, and this is published, I can share with you guys after we're done. He essentially did a research slash competition, uh, which is absolutely amazing. Like this new way of doing things, is just, I just love it. Uh, mm. He basically did a competition of uh, for creators, for artists and 3D artists, to try and create something that people on psychedelics, specifically with LSD, if I'm not mistaken, will be able to see hidden messages in on a regular basis. So something that you can always do across individuals all the time, but it has, but 
they calculated that it needs to have certain parameters. It can't just be noise. There's like particular things there. Uh, and he discovered that that is in fact the case. That is now established or established to a degree. Um, essentially, he had a bunch of artists create those like, you know, beautiful kind of like the things you see on when you have a rave, like trans raves and you have all those like amazing mm -hmm. things on the screens. So something like that. And then people on LSD can basically see patterns in it on a regular basis and you can't see it without. So he proved that, that by certain usage of certain psychedelics, it puts your brain in a state that allows you to see content, objective content that we know is there. So that's proof uh, that you couldn't before. So that to answer your question directly. So you definitely see in the DMT space things that seem to be not related to your position. Like no matter where you move, they stay in their own side. They have their own mm -hmm. special coordinates. They have a reality of their own. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, I'm experiencing something very coherently. I'm putting out a new video about it right now. Um, I'm experiencing this weird console that comes up for me that just, it looks like a computer console that just always shows up now, a hundred percent of the time. It started happening after I built the laser. Uh, I'm going to talk about it at length in the video, uh, but essentially it definitely falls in the family of a new kind of visual on DMT where it's just, it's just a real object. It's just made from this space, but it has all the parameters of a regular object. It has its own spatial coordinates. It has its own uh, 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 rigidity, insistence to be itself over time. It's not like morphing into other things, like a lot of things in, in the DMT mm -hmm. space. It's completely mm -hmm. opaque. Just imagine this hovering, right? So if this appears for you in the DMT space, you and it just stays in the air, and you walk around it, that's different than geometrical pad paddles that just come up and change and all. That's different, right? Is it holographic in nature? In, in what sense do you mean that? Um, is it, you can see through it, I understand, but is it kind of that shiny pinkish purplish it color? Has, so some of it, some of them have iridescent qualities, it would kind of like, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but the, the console itself, like the body of it, it different sections on the mm -hmm. floor, it, it has different sections on the floor. It's completely opaque. It's, uh, space gray. I always say Steve Jobs would flip in his grave if he would see this thing. This is the most beautifully designed thing you've ever seen in your entire life. And it only has the iridescent stuff running on the on the rims, like it kind of runs on the rim, oh, like this most futuristic thing you've ever seen. It's almost like a capsule that opens up, and then it has different sections that come up. There's different screens. There's gloves, and there's you know there's a carousel of like VR glasses on my left. I mean, the details are Have you asked? You can use it. Have you asked it? How do I get to use you? It's not like me building you and bringing you down here. It's how do I get to vibrate at the frequency in which I can engage with you in the state that you are. It's already built for yeah. you. So this is the conversation you and I had off uh, camera, right? And I, I actually wanted to turn this question to you. So I'm glad you asked me. Uh, because one of the so let me just preface it by saying that I'm very open to the possibility that at the moment, I'm just vibrating at a lower frequency than people who say things like you're saying. Uh, and I don't mean it like tongue in cheek, like I, I actually mean it. Because uh, I, I, I meet a lot of wonderful people that tell me these kind of things that the way you're speaking. I'm very open to the possibility that I'm simply not aware of that because I'm not there yet. Uh, so I'm open to that. But there is, there is not as there's not such stability in there, right? Like sometimes I get to be there and sometimes I'm here, right? It's just the level in which you're experiencing. Re what I say is when something matters, it materializes. So the, I think also the place of neutrality allows for a higher experience, higher level. Right, but the only, but the, but the, the second part of this is, I, I fully accept what you're saying. It's just that the only, the other part of this for me is that the same thing that led me to the laser, this kind of thinking about it, Mm -hmm. is the thing that brought about both what I just described to you and extra content that see, when I talk to other experienced psychonauts, they describe instances sometimes of haphazardly see things kind of like that, but I can just ask, I can not even ask, I can just choose to see it and I see certain things. So like I see structures, for example, that appear in the room when you just smoke, uh one mm -hmm. of them is being like a thing next to the door uh it's like a client it's like a, this one looks a little different in its texture it looks more cloudy like it's cl made out of a cloud it's triangles but they're very distinct so triangles that appear imagine those are triangles and there's a bunch of them i don't know how many but they basically appear all kind of like around each other and then they arrange themselves into a sphere this is around every door in the house 
into a sphere and then they spread and they do this dance around the house. They kind of fly around. I see this like I see this watch, just so you understand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and then they come mm -hmm. back and then they collect themselves back into a sphere. They also move in a very kind of like coherent way and then they come back and they like whoosh, close into a sphere and then they open from the sphere and they create straps. They literally look like straps and they arrange themselves on the surface of the door and they kind of close. It's almost like protection. So they're like closed on the door. Absolutely protection. Um, a, I think it's protection and B, I think that the DMT is behaving in a more solid way to actually allow you and your psyche to believe that like, okay, there's not such a huge leap between me being here and for being able to use you in this abstract, oh, I don't exist. Like it's showing an element of object permanence. It's it's coming down into your density so it can be workable in like, as Kirsten would call it, the avatar yeah. or with the body. So I don't think it's necessarily you disappearing. I think it's really possibility, right? And the more that you normalize because this experience is happening so consistently, because the brain, in my opinion, is running pattern recognition software, you are now normalizing in your experience some kind of relationship with this software, this hardware, this console. So I think it's not if, I think it's just a matter of when. And I don't think that mm -hmm. you need, maybe, yeah, sure, forgive your mother one more time, that'll help. <laughs> but I also <laughs> think more so that this is possible, right? This is mm -hmm. possible because this is already happening. And of course this is possible. I exist in the frequency of possibility because everything is me. This is why I like to get rid of the they because I'm playing a game with myself. So that gives me total power to manipulate whatever I'm experiencing. This is why I like to get rid of they, but you get to keep them. That's fine. I, they can stay. <laughs> but I think it's just that. It's a meeting of two where this is a plane we can coexist and I get to utilize and really, because you're already in relationship with it. Look at what you've created from it. I think this is next. And all that's necessary, let's take out necessity. All that you get to do is continue to remind yourself this is possible because it's already happening and it's happening fre frequently and consistency in my perception of reality and consistently in my perception of reality. Does that make sense? No. It does make sense that it actually took me a few times of uh, talking to you to really kind of land into because I've heard versions of this, uh, but I really like the way you're framing it. You, you, you're you reconciling uh, quite a few domains that it's very difficult to reconcile. And uh, I'm very impressed by that. I but I, like we all can all speak is just from our own personal experience. It's like uh, I don't know if you saw the last conversation that I published between uh, uh, Peter Rollins and Charles Eisenstein. But they, something that Charles said, and this is where I feel I am, and again, I'm always open for revision, is just that that perception seems to me to be very anthropocentric. It's, it's, it's like, you can say, yeah, we're, we're only, this is all me, and, and when I say me, not Danny, but like the collective me, right, all about the same thing. Um, cause that's what I'm hearing you saying. Uh, and then we play this game of pretending to be different units and different things. So I am me and I am the console and I am the structure and I am the thing and I am DMT and I am all of these things and I'm just doing it not to get bored and feel alone and all of that. And there's a certain process that it, it seems to be involved, but I cannot shake the feeling off that, and again, Please, please understand, I'm, I'm taking everything you're saying on board very, um, I really take to heart everything you're saying. And I, uh, but I, I, I personally can't shake off the feeling that is, there's somebody else in the group. So there's, there's well, I yeah. think should, And again, and uh, we had a conversation earlier about mm -hmm. like, of course, me as the maternal, I'm the embodied maternal energy. That's the circle that contains you're the masculine penetrative energy. It's your, you exist within the feminine and you get to divide. So we have something to do. So it's not like you see it wrong and I see it right. It's together. We collaboratively create it. Okay. And I think the question, is, it's not like, is this happening in my brain? It's what's the fucking size of the brain, right? So it. I absolutely do. I have had, a, I have a very long, very consistent relationship with DMT. It presents <laughs> as the other sometimes, and it's fully and convincingly something else. And it's like, I'm not anything but else on you. But, but, like, but I have to ask you, why do you take that turn in the fork of the road when you see that it appears very convincingly <laughs> as something else? 
the reason that I take that turn in the fork of the road is because there's power in that. Okay, so actually now we're speaking the same language. Because for me, mm -hmm. it's not about me making a point. It's not about who's right. That actually makes no difference. The only thing that matters, and I think anything that should matter to anybody, is what's actionable and, u and useful. So if, so if, exactly. So if seeing that this, and actually this might be the case, in fact, and that is essentially what I feel that you're saying, is that when you choose to perceive it the way you're saying, it, there's power in that to do certain things. Uh, heal, bring things about, manifest things, things like that. But I would say that when you try and see it through this lens, which is a little bit more scientific, uh, in the, mm -hmm. um, not in, and when I say scientific, I don't mean higher. I just mean it's a different way of- Dude, yeah, yeah, yeah. speak to me. Yeah. I, like, yeah, I, I just want to be sure because sometimes people think this is like a, you know, a condescending uh, a way of looking at it. It's, it's the, the rigidity of the of the frame that I'm describing might have power to do things that the other frame does not. For example, uh, building certain physical technologies that you wouldn't be able to without perceiving an external thing. So th if we can create like warp drive or something through and this interacting with that other, right, to and then you manifest that other in a form that wasn't possible before when we just thought of Einstein's field equations that lock mm -hmm. us down with the speed of light and you can go faster. So maybe, it, yeah. So that, so I think that that's uh, you know that's a great common ground to stand on uh, at least for now until we know better. Whatever gets us to using the console, I'm good. Like I'm, I'm. It, that's what you are. I think there's beauty in having an open mind. Like if I have a conversation that brings evidence to the table that my belief system isn't the smartest one anymore, being flexible with the belief system for the sake of efficiency allows us to more collectively create a more enjoyable reality. So, dude, I love a prove me wrong. No, I, I'm happy. I'm not trying to. <laughs> it's, it's just a race to who can make objects levitate their hands first. That's it. <laughs> like, if I can do that, you'll win. If you can do that, you'll win. If I can do that, I win. <laughs> Done. I, I'm working on it. Even knows teleporting, all of that. We're on it. So. it did, you, did you ever see Looper? Oh, that's a great flick. It's a little dark, but it's a great flick. It's with uh, uh, Bruce Willis and uh, what's his name? Um, forget his name, but he's anyways. It's about time travel. It's a great, great film. I would watch it if, if you want. And in it, there's like this future in which people develop this weird ability, but nobody knows what to do with it. So people are just like <laughs> trying to impress girls by trying to eliminate like coins and things like that. It's like, it, that's it. That's all they got to figure out how to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect. That's actually kind of funny. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but something that's happening when I work with DMT is it's doing something to my eyes. It almost feels like it's shifting my vision and um, doing stuff with the left and right hemisphere of the brain. Um, and I've been able to, I can, I don't know exactly how to describe this, but see things really in more dimensions than I would normally be able to hear, right? Like I could see that, like you can look at the analog of a cube, right? But it's, you can't actually perceive the cube. Well, it appears that I'm able to, with DMT, perceive the entire cube. Have you noticed anything like that happening with yourself? Just to see if I understand you, you mean that you, when you're saying analog of a cube, you mean that it's drawn on two dimensions and you manage to perceive the actual three dimensions? Yes. Uh, yeah, well, to the extent that I understand your question, I did manage to mm -hmm. feel and experience uh, at least a fourth mm -hmm. dimension of time. Uh, it's yeah. Sorry, of, of space. Uh, it's, it's like it's a new in in. It's, it's a new in. It's almost like you can. Yeah. It's a new. It's almost mm -hmm. like where gravity pulls towards that we don't quite understand because yeah. it pulls into something physicists call the bulk, which is the four-dimensional manifold that all this is folding into. But then I mm -hmm. felt that, like I could, I, 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 when I moved my hand, I was, I knew what this direction is. So in that sense, yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. It's an understanding. Intuitively, mm -hmm. I think that DMT is teaching you mathematics in higher dimensions. The, the experience of that, yeah. And I think mm -hmm. this, is, this is the key. I think that what my larger proposition, which is much more audacious actually even than saying that the laser shows us something real, is that I think we have to reframe certain things in science in general, which is again, this Absolutely. is our time and opportunity to put the experience and the experiencer, the observer into for lack of a better term, our equations. 
the equations will look different because there's, I'm talking about this in the recent video I released about this, like an update video, is that there's something about experience, the quality, the, 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 the quality of experience, mm -hmm. the redness of red, the, the taste of water, those things mm -hmm. are not equations. They are the experience of those things. And in fact, when you observe closely, uh, the equations and the, the thought process that goes into uh, abstracting these things uh, are actually the analogs. They are the representations. The, it, so we have it mm -hmm. completely upside down. We say, okay, well, not with you. Repeat. Uh, so science, at least the majority of modern science, looks at it like a, the mind is an arising property of the brain. And because of that, mm -hmm. they think of the external things that they personally have never seen and cannot see, like atoms and galaxies and things like that. Um, and they they assume that to be the realness and then they look at experience and they say that's somehow secondary that is some kind of an arising property of all that other stuff that i've never seen but i have mm -hmm. mathematics to describe things about those things that i've never seen that i can then utilize to do things in the real world so, mm -hmm. so then they so then they can take this mathematics which is once again an abstraction mm -hmm. about those things that I've never seen, like atoms and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then I'm making conjectures about what I think will happen if I do this or that. And I'm constructing a picture of what mm -hmm. I think is going on in the rest of the world that I cannot feel with my senses. That's how, science, okay. that's how physics works. And then right. what validates the cash value of these images of the world, these models, is whether or not they map on to things that actually work. And this is mm -hmm. something that I do have to say in the favor of science, that I don't know if a lot of people understand. It's not just, not everything works. Most things don't work. So most, mm -hmm. most, most things, 99.999% of all experiments we've ever done don't, didn't work. So it's only the things that worked over time, over many, 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 many repetitions is the thing that's counted for as real and then the validity of the things that were assumed about that i.e the standard model of physics for example then it's considered to be a, a good stable theory that can inform us about other things we've never seen before that process is very important but what i'm suggesting is that there's something about experience itself uh, as in the redness of red itself mm -hmm that informs us about certain things that can mm -hmm. give us a map into the ex into the realness of the universe in a way that doing all everything I just described with coming up with those uh, models and theories can't. And I well, isn't the experience, it's when you add experience to the equation, now you're in an iteration. That, that's right? the problem. That is the, well, you're an iteration, first of all, that introduces that problem. You're absolutely correct. But, but to only to an extent, because the iteration, like you, you can't walk through walls. For all intents and purposes right now, right? So, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to make sure. Okay. That, I think that people who claim, the, you know, the, 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 who, who adopt this, this, uh, picture of the world that everything is mind made, forget that there are a lot of things they can't do, no matter how much they want to do it. And then and then the game begins of how do you mm -hmm. reconcile this? You say, well, you know, the larger mind has layers that does it. Okay, cool, no problem. But you have to map it into something that is actionable. So mm -hmm. a lot of things can make sense. I don't I don't remember who said it, I think it was Whitehead. He said, I'm paraphrasing, but the gist of it is Anything is possible, but some things actually went through the formality of actually existing. Got it. And, and that mm -hmm. is very important. And the, the, the yes. mechanism by which the things that went through that formality to actually exist, we should yeah. talk about that mechanism. So even if it's the larger mind and it's just mm -hmm. mind and all of that, there's still rules by which the smaller portions of mind like ourselves live in. And those mm -hmm. rules are not all created equal. And, and we should talk about that. I guess that, that's my... 
I think you do a really beautiful gap. Uh, I think you do a really beautiful job of bridging the gap between here and there. I think that that's a superpower mm-hmm. of yours, and I respect mm-hmm. it and appreciate it. I very appreciate much. that. <laughs> it means a lot coming from Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Danny, where would you like to see this research go? Like what ideally, where, where does this lead? Um, right now, the way I see it is that I, I'm, I'm speaking, uh, I had uh, one conversation with Chris from the Imperial College in London, Dr. Timmerman. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm in contact with, um, with other people that are involved with this project to different degrees. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're obviously engaged with the portion of even validating the experience which is very important because somebody has to create the real bridge between what I'm talking about and mm-hmm. the, the larger science. Larger science will not even touch the subject until somebody like Timmerman will come along and do a double blind, do many of them and establish a frame that says, hey guys, there's something here, okay? It needs to speak their language. Mm-hmm. I'm in a much mm-hmm. prior, more prior stage of trying to get these brilliant minds interested and convince them that there's something to look for here. So yeah. with people yeah. like like neuroscientists, uh, they will be interested in establishing that this is even a real thing. Great, they should do that. I personally am much is much. I'm much more interested in trying to see if we can build something to it. So I'm working with a couple of physicists that are helping me to create like an official uh, uh, research program. Uh, potentially try and get a budget for it. Because I think I think we will have something the, the second we try some of the things that uh, I think should be tried, uh, and I think that from that angle, the second you have even one thing, even one, that is measurably different about physical reality through playing with these parameters, the need to establish that the experience is real through trying to you know kind of find a standardized version of uh, of this line across individuals, Mm -hmm. there's no need for that anymore. Like I said, if I can make this thing levitate, I don't need to prove to anybody that this is real because clearly something is different, right? And that's really Mm -hmm. what I'm I'm interested in uh, to try and, you know, uh, engage with in the next couple of years. And like like you said, I I see myself as somebody who's bridging. So my goal Mm -hmm. would be to work on myself as a better and better communicator to try and maybe help both sides see that in many ways, they're not talking about the same, that they are talking about the same thing, hmm. but right. in, in yeah. the ways they're not talking about the same thing, I, I want to help to reconcile that because even if it, like, like I said, even if we're just one mind, there is still a truth to the matter. Hmm. That, that's, that's really my, I think if I have to it's, it's summarize my entire body <laughs> of work, it would be that, which is mm-hmm. that, Whatever it is, there's still truth to the matter, and I'm interested in that truth. I'm interested too. So (laughs) this will be um, exciting. Listen, Danny, I'd like to have you on again after, you know, I know in the next couple of months you're going to have even more stuff going on, and we will definitely keep in touch and have you on again because this is a conversation that needs that isn't going to go away and needs to keep happening and we'll hope this ontological debate and conversation can keep going and going and going from here so it was, it was, thank you guys for coming on oh, and by the way one small comment before you go this mm-hmm. is i had a i was on a podcast uh in the beginning mm-hmm. of this process and the hosts of the summer uh, podcast and they they did a great job at interviewing me but they did an opener before they did the experiment in which they talk about me without me being present. And it was funny to watch because they did the opener before we spoke and before they tried it. And then mm-hmm. they did the final words of the same episode after already they tried the laser. And it was amazing mm-hmm. to watch the change in the conversation. <laughs> so for us, the, the version of that would be that we do one more after you guys try it and then we can talk about this a little bit more. We'll do absolutely do, mm. do a study. We'll do a fucking study on it, and then we'll get. Back <laughs> All thank right. So well, thank you guys so much. It's been amazing having you on. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.